Imagine Europe in 550 AD. Rome has fallen. Gothic warlords carve kingdoms from the ruins. Scythian horsemen thunder across the steppe. Thracian tribes hold the mountains. Now blink. A single century passes. It's 650 AD. The Goths vanished. The Scythians erased. The Thracians forgotten. And in their place, stretching from the Baltic to the Adriatic, from the Elba to the Volga, a new people dominates the map. The Slavs. How do entire nations disappear overnight? And how does a culture that left almost no trace in archaeology suddenly command half of Europe? This is the greatest magic trick in European history. And for centuries, historians have failed to explain it. For a thousand years, scholars have debated the mystery. Some claim the Slavs were always here, hiding in the forests, invisible until they emerged. Others argued they were outsiders, exploding out of the marshes in a tidal wave of conquest. Both sides had scraps of evidence. Neither could solve the paradox. But today, science has cracked the case. DNA pulled from ancient graves is exposing a story that politics tried to bury. A story of peoples who never vanished, but transformed. The Chronicles said the Goths, Scythians, and Thracians disappeared. The genetics say their blood still flows, hidden beneath Slavic identity. You're watching Stone and Bone, where we uncover history's most forbidden secrets through science. If you want to see how DNA rewrites everything we thought we knew about the past, hit subscribe, because this revelation will change how you see Europe forever. Stand on a hilltop in Central Europe around the year 400 AD. Below you, the continent is alive with tribes. Gothic settlements spread across Poland. Vandals march toward North Africa. Scythian horsemen gallop across the Ukrainian steppe, bows flashing in the sun. Thracian clans in the Balkans carve their identities into stone, their warriors still feared by Rome. But scroll the map forward just two centuries. By 650 AD, the chronicles fall silent. These names vanish. The Goths who sacked Rome are gone. The Scythians, once called the Terror of Empires, have disappeared. Thracians and Illyrians, tribes mentioned for centuries, no longer exist as distinct peoples. Instead, a new word dominates every chronicler's page. Slavs. Byzantine writers describe endless raids across the Danube. Arab geographers mention them in distant markets. And by 700 AD, Slavic-speaking peoples stretch from the Elba to the Volga, from the Baltic Sea to the Adriatic coast. Here lies the paradox. The Celts left burial mounds stretching back millennia. The Germanic tribes, pottery and runes tracing their past. But the Slavs? Almost nothing before the sixth century. Then, suddenly, they are everywhere, more numerous than any other group in Europe. How do entire peoples vanish overnight? And how does another appear out of thin air? For centuries, the trail went cold, until science picked it up again. The first breakthrough didn't come from ruins or chronicles, it came from blood. In the late 20th century, geneticists mapped the Y chromosomes of Slavic populations. Over half of men in Poland, Ukraine, and Russia carried a lineage called R1A. At first, it looked like the missing key, the Slavic genetic stamp. But there was a problem. R1A wasn't just Slavic. It appeared everywhere Indo-European herders had migrated. In India, among Brahmin priests. In Iran, among Persian tribes. Even in Viking graves in Scandinavia. R1A was ancient, nearly 20,000 years old. Far too broad to pinpoint Slavs alone. Finding it in a Slav was like finding a Toyota Camry at a crime scene. It proved someone had been there, but not who. The real revelation came when scientists learned to read the fine print. Not just the broad haplogroup, but its subclades, the tiny branches that marked specific peoples, and two branches stood out, R1AZ280 and R1AM458. Unlike the parent lineage, these were sharp and recent. Z280 clustered in Eastern Slavs, Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians. M458 concentrated in Western Slavs, 
Poles, Czechs, Slovaks. A landmark 2015 study by Peter Underhill and his team confirmed that these subclades were almost entirely concentrated in Slavic-speaking populations. Dating techniques placed their origin around 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, deep in Central and Eastern Europe. At last, the Slavic license plate had been found. But when researchers tested ancient skeletons, the story didn't just confirm old theories, it turned them upside down. Now travel to Poland, around 400 AD. Picture a Gothic village. Germanic pottery fills the homes. Runes mark the burials. These are the tribes who would one day sack Rome itself. Jump ahead two centuries. By 600 AD, archaeology reveals a different scene. Slavic huts, Slavic tools, Slavic rituals. Textbooks long claimed the Goths migrated west, leaving Poland empty for Slavic settlers to occupy. But when scientists examined the DNA, the illusion collapsed. Pre-500 AD burials carried Germanic lineages like I-1 and R-1B, classic Northern European signatures. Post-500 AD burials carried the Slavic marker R1AM458. And yet, beneath the surface, their autosomal DNA, the total genetic picture, showed massive continuity. Over 80 to 90% of the genes matched. A 2018 study in current biology confirmed it. The so-called Slavs of medieval Poland were nearly indistinguishable from the earlier Germans. In other words, the Goths didn't vanish. They didn't march away into the West. They stayed and became Slavs. It's like watching someone change clothes while remaining the same person underneath. What disappeared wasn't the people. It was their identity. And here's something I'd love to know from you. Do you think identity is defined more by blood or by culture? Drop your thoughts in the comments. I want to see where you stand. Now ride east onto the endless Ukrainian steppe. For a thousand years, this was the kingdom of the Scythians, fierce nomads whose golden treasures still dazzle museum visitors, whose mounted archers humbled even Persian kings. Greek historians filled volumes describing their feasts, their battles, their pride. Then the chronicles fall silent. By the 600s, the Scythians are gone. In their place, Slavic farmers build villages of timber and clay. To historians, it looked like extinction, a warrior nation erased in a single generation. But genetics told another story. Ancient DNA from Scythian burials revealed a close match to the Yamnaya steppe herders, the very people who spread Indo-European languages across half the world. And when those genomes were compared to modern populations, the connection was immediate. A 2018 science study led by Eska Villerslev confirmed that Scythian DNA overlaps strongly with modern Ukrainians and Southern Russians. In other words, the Scythians never disappeared. Their bloodlines endured, transformed under a new cultural identity. The warlords of the steppe became Slavic-speaking farmers. What looked like disappearance was really survival in disguise. Now head south into the rugged Balkans, for centuries, this was Thracian and Illyrian country, mountain chiefs, tribal fortresses, ornate jewelry that rivaled the Greeks. Roman chroniclers wrote of their ferocity in war. History books say they were swept away when Slavic tribes crossed the Danube in the 6th and 7th centuries. Conquered, displaced, erased. But modern genetics paints a different picture. Across the Balkans today, the dominant paternal lineage isn't Slavic R1A but haplogroup I2A. And I2A is ancient, the genetic legacy of Europe's first hunter-gatherers who settled these valleys more than 10,000 years ago. Large-scale studies, like Matheson et al., 2018 published in Nature, traced this lineage back through Mesolithic Balkan burials, showing a direct line from prehistory to the present. That means modern South Slavs, Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, Bulgarians, are not the descendants of foreign invaders. They are the heirs of Thracians and Illyrians who never left. The conquerors didn't replace the conquered. The conquered became Slavs. The foundations remained the same. 
Only the cultural walls were repainted. By now, the pattern is unmistakable. In Poland, Goths didn't vanish. They became Slavs. In Ukraine, Scythians didn't disappear. They became Slavs. In the Balkans, Thracians and Illyrians didn't fall to conquest. They became Slavs. Everywhere, the same paradox repeats. Peoples vanish on paper, but survive in their DNA. How? What kind of system can erase identities without erasing bloodlines? The answer lies in culture. Archaeology shows early Slavic villages were small, egalitarian, and adaptive. Their farming methods thrived in forests and river valleys abandoned after Rome's collapse. Their pagan faith didn't crush local gods. It absorbed them. Their society allowed flexible leadership instead of rigid hierarchies and their language was the ultimate secret weapon. Compared to Latin or Germanic tongues, Old Slavic was simple, regular, and easy to learn as a second language. For fractured communities searching for stability, Slavic culture was a survival strategy, a package of beliefs, practices, and words that just worked. It wasn't just an invasion, it was a cultural virus, one so adaptable it could infect Gothic kings, Scythian horsemen, Thracian farmers, and turned them all into Slavs while their bloodlines quietly lived on. Let me throw this question to you. What do you think spreads faster through history, armies, religions, or languages? Comment your answer below. I'm curious to see which side wins. To grasp how extraordinary this was, Compare it with other great cultural shifts. When Rome expanded, Latin spread across Europe. But the peoples of Spain and Gaul stayed genetically Celtic. When Islam rose, Arabic spread across North Africa and the Middle East. But the bloodlines remained Berber, Persian, Egyptian. The Slavic story followed the same pattern, but without the usual engines of empire. No Rome, no caliphate, no prophet or scripture. Just villages, flexible customs, and a language so accessible that fractured communities embraced it. And the results were staggering. By the year 1000, Slavic-speaking peoples stretched across one-fifth of Europe's landmass, from the frozen forests near the Arctic Circle to the sunlit shores of Greece, from the rivers of Czechia and Slovakia to the plains of Belarus and Russia. This was not the expansion of a single tribe. It was the most successful cultural revolution Europe had ever seen. But if the genetic evidence was this clear, why didn't we learn this in school? The answer lies in politics. By the 19th century, nationalism was reshaping Europe. Nations demanded clear, simple stories of their origins, pure lineages, ancient homelands, unbroken bloodlines. For panslavists, the myth of shared blood was essential. For the Soviet Union centuries later, it was even more important. Moscow needed the fiction of one great Slavic family to justify its sphere of influence. The Warsaw Pact wasn't just a military alliance. It was branded as the reunion of ancient brothers. But reality was messier. Poles carried Gothic echoes. Ukrainians carried Scythian blood. Serbs and Croats were, in large part, Thracians and Illyrians reborn. The Slavic expansion was cultural not genetic. And that truth was inconvenient. It blurred the lines that nationalist movements wanted sharp. It threatened the idea of us versus them. So it was silenced. The story of cultural assimilation was buried beneath myths of conquest and purity. But DNA cannot be censored. Bones keep their secrets for centuries. And now, as science reads them, the forbidden story is finally coming to light. Fast forward to today. Across Eastern Europe, millions of people send their saliva to companies like 23 and Me or My Heritage, eager to uncover their past. And the results often shock them. A poll discovers markers tied to Germanic ancestors, the same Goths who once marched on Rome. A Ukrainian's report highlights Scythian connections, echoing the golden riders of the steppe. A Serbian opens their results and finds the ancient lineage of Balkan hunter-gatherers stretching back 10 millennia. 
it's not rare. These surprises are now everyday realities, quietly confirming what genetic studies have already revealed. The Slavic identity was never about purity. It was about transformation. For some, the results are thrilling. For others, unsettling. Clashing with the neat national myths taught in schools. But the deeper truth is clear. Our identities are not single threads. They are tapestries, woven from many strands. DNA testing makes the forbidden history personal. It reminds us that we carry echoes of vanished peoples, Goths, Scythians, Thracians, who live on not in textbooks, but in our blood. So what was the greatest magic trick in European history? It wasn't making entire nations vanish. It was turning them into something new. To be Polish is to carry Gothic echoes. To be Ukrainian is to inherit Scythian blood. To be Serbian is to bear Thracian DNA. And to be all of them is to be Slavic. The Slavs were never one tribe bound by a single bloodline. They were a phenomenon, a cultural force that rewrote Europe without erasing its past. And here's the forbidden truth. If you've ever taken a DNA test, you know these stories don't just belong to history. They live in us. Hidden lineages, unexpected matches, ancient migrations. Our blood carries the secrets textbooks forgot. Culture can be stronger than conquest. Identity can outlive empire. And the real story of Europe isn't about vanished peoples. It's about transformations that never stopped. You've been watching Stone and Bone. If this hidden history opened your eyes, share it and subscribe because the next secret in our DNA is waiting to be uncovered.